Hello everyone and welcome to uh, this edition of our video content, the Bethel Methodist Church. I pastor the Bethel Methodist Church of the Hill Country, but also I'm general superintendent of all the Bethel Methodist churches. So we're welcoming anybody from our churches that are listening. Also anybody that happened to check us out on Facebook or wherever you have access uh, to this information. We're glad you're here. I want to thank Gary Baltus, who uh, bought for us a really nice external mic. I can't find it right now, so I'm going to have to try to speak up loudly. We use it at church at different times and different places. And my technology specialist, a.k.a. my wife Cindy, uh, is not here right now. So I'm going to just try to speak up and hopefully uh, the sound quality will be fine. Last time, Cindy said the ca uh, the candle was crooked. That was because I had that wireless mic kind of stuck under there so you could hear me better. But that's okay. I think this will be fine. I want us to go to Revelation 20, beginning with verse 11. It says, And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. In other words, there was no competition for this one who sat on the throne, the God of eternity. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were open. And we know the that judgment is according to God's word, uh, the Bible clearly states. So we know the books that we have access to by the grace of God uh, are going to be the books of the Bible that are going to be there. and We're going to be judged according to those things. And then it says another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. So not only do we have the, the revelation of God and the words of the Bible, but we also have the Lamb's book of life. Those who've had the righteousness of the law uh, happen in their lives because of a relationship with Jesus Christ. Those are the ones who will be written in the Lamb's book of life. Then it says, the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. This lets us know that men will have already been judged because uh, they'll come from hell, they'll come from uh, heaven, they'll come from everywhere that men are to, uh, to be a part of this judgment. So their destiny is already sealed. So Judgment Day isn't to determine my destiny or yours. Judgment Day is to let us know once and for all God was right in everything that he has decided in the past and he's deciding at that very moment. It says, And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Now this is a prophetic picture of that final judgment. And the book of Revelation has some highly symbolic language and images, as most of you know. Uh, when held together with the rest of God's word, we can easily find out what those messages are. Uh, for example, in verse 15, where it says they were written, those not written in the book of life were cast into the lake of fire. A lake of fire is a symbol of a real hell. But what is the image? Uh, it's a, a lava flow. It is uh, that which comes forth from volcanic activity is the symbol. It has uh, brimstone. It has sulfur in it, as we all know. What a powerful image. The, the flow of lava destroys everything in its path. If you've ever seen anything taken over or thrown into a lake of fire or a lake of lava, it's just destroyed. It's taken away. Uh, but is that a literal description of, of this very real hell, or is it a symbolic or uh, symbolic imagery? Uh, the Bible gives us a literal description of hell, and at the, at the end I'm going to share that with you, one of the places that that exists. But it uses these earthly examples so often. In the Old Testament, you have references to Sheol, uh, which is a more general term, meaning the place of the dead, uh, or Hades, the Greek equivalent of Sheol. But the dominant Greek New Testament image of hell is the word Gehenna, 
it was a real place on earth, but it was used of God as a powerful image or symbol of a very real place called hell. Gehenna was and is a valley southwest of Jerusalem just outside the gates. In the Old Testament, it was a place of a despicable act of sacrificing babies to the pagan deity Moloch. Uh, it, it was such a horrible act and such a horrible event that that became a place of disgust, a place of uh, uncleanness. And later, uh, it's reported that it became a garbage dump. And what is a better symbol or image of hell than a garbage dump? How appropriate. Uh, fires are burned, whether they're the fires of the sacrificial fires of Moloch or the burning of trash and the worms and the maggots of such a place. These are just symbols of a very real place. When Jesus said in Mark 9, 43, If thy hand offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter into life maimed than having two hands to go into hell, into Gehenna, the Greek word Gehenna, into the fire that never shall be quenched. Now those earthly fires were quenched, but he's talking about something that those things symbolize that will never be quenched. Where the worm dieth not, those worms have died. But he's talking about a place where the disgust of that place uh, it will never end. And the fire is not quenched. The fires of Moloch, as I said, have gone out. Garbage and trash fires and maggots would die out. But never the purifying reason for hell. The nasty, offensive stench of sin must be gone. It's not just smelling up the place. It's a danger in carrying the disease of sin. Uh, hell speaks of the enormity of our sin. How disgusting and what a threat it is to God and to his creation and his environment. He's only allowed it to expose it for what it is, but he's going to be rid of it. Uh, justice spoke loudly on Calvary. God's disgust for my sins and your sins was poured out on his holy son. It was a display of judgment that we would understand and know this is what our sins deserve. This is the enormity of sin in God's creation. And justice says sin must be gone. We must recognize it for what it is. We must understand the gravity of sin as, it, as expressed and remedied, fortunately and blessedly, by Jesus. Or you can reject what God says and what God offers. And listen, this is what the gospel is all about. You can be changed by a relationship with Jesus Christ, recognizing that your sins deserve what he experienced on the cross. That's what my sins deserve. That's what the sins of the world deserves. And we can recognize that and we can accept the fact that Jesus endured that so that I could receive him. That he could come into my life and change me so that I wouldn't have to be part of God's garbage dump. I could be changed instead of removed. One day all that offends shall be removed. And on that day, all will understand, God, you did what you had to do. God, you've done everything you could do to remedy this problem. You've offered your son. You've offered an alternate way for sin to be dealt with. And are you in agreement with God? You will on the day of judgment. And that'll be expressed either by stunned silence of those who thought, well, a God of love won't do that, or a God of love accept my pit pitiful works instead of uh, a relationship with Jesus Christ that changes us from within. Uh, we're going to be sadly disappointed on that day if we're depending on anything else except a relationship with Jesus Christ. And there's a literal description of hell. We have all these symbolic representations of hell. But there's a one in Second uh, Thessalonians, and it's in chapter 1, beginning with verse 7. 
to you are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Here's the problem. You don't know God and you haven't obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ in order to know God. And God is going to come and he's going to have to put an end to sin. He's coming in vengeance. He's coming in justice that is required to cleanse this world and God's creation of this detestable, rotting thing called sin that threatens the health of God's creation. He's going to punish them, it says in verse 9, with everlasting destruction. That does not mean annihilation. That means alteration of original purpose. God created us for a purpose, but we are going to never realize that purpose. Everlasting destruction. Listen, here's the, the literal description of hell. Destruction from something. Uh, it's separation. Destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. The psalmist says the heavens declare the glory of God. And so this literal description that God's coming to, uh, it, to bring this punishment that is everlasting destruction, he gives this literal account of what it is to be removed from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Permanent removal from God and everything that he's made. It's not intentional torture. It's going to involve eternal pain of regret, absolutely. But it is God just simply removing the threat, taking out the garbage of sin from his creation. From the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. And we, will you understand what God has to do? Will you agree and come under the leadership of Jesus Christ. Repent of self-leadership and the stench of the mess that we make of our lives and of God's creation when we don't allow him to be God. Repent of our sins and ask him to come in and be the ruler, the Lord. Uh, come under the leadership of Jesus Christ and let him rule. You won't regret it. And he's made a way through Christ that you can come under his leadership. And if you do that, you will stay with him for all of eternity. If you don't do that, you will have to be removed from God's wonderful, restored, cleansed adventure of all of eternity called heaven. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. And uh, the Bible clearly states that uh, your thoughts are higher than ours. That means you have something that is far more important. You have something that uh, is far beyond what any human could ever figure out on his own about uh, who you are and what you're doing. But thanks be unto you. Thanks be unto God. You've made a way through Christ that we can know you and we can come under your leadership and sin can be dealt with in our lives we can be changed instead of removed. That is the grace of God in Christ. And I pray that for everyone who hears, everyone who needs to hear, help us to spread the word that Christ has made a way that sin can be dealt with instead of us being removed forever. Thank you, Father, for your love. Thank you for your provision in Christ. In his name we pray, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. <laughs>